here with Anne Thomas, who is the senior curator of our photographs collection at the National Gallery of Canada. Um, she's joining us. We're both meeting in, in uh, virtual space, let's say, uh, but we're both tuning in from Ottawa, which is on unceded Algonquin territory. The plan is to speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to have uh, open it up to some questions for the last five minutes. And we have something um, kind of special to share uh, at the end, so it's worth um, hanging on for a little <laughs> bit. But, but first, Anne, I realized we forgot yeah. to talk about French. We have to talk about what we're drinking and what we're drinking it from. Isn't that the, that's the, that's the convention with this series? Yes. Well, you know, this is rather sad uh, because it's a margarita glass. But because I'm, uh, these are work hours for me, I'm afraid it's got water in it. <laughs> and but not a margarita. But, but the, the glass margarita, is significant. The margarita, we'll talk about it in a moment because there's a good margarita connection with Judd and, uh, and Bryden. Okay, so I, I'm also drinking water. I'm, I'm keeping it yeah, sober for our talk. But I did choose a very special um, beaker, I guess, to drink it out of. It's, it was designed by... Um, the Dutch designer, Helle Jungarius. And the whole premise of this design um, is that when it's, when it's fired, it develops imperfections. So it's not meant to be a perfect beaker, mm -hmm. um, which I think is kind of apropos for, for talking about Judd because there's this really persistent myth about him being a perfectionist and him being mm -hmm. interested in, in kind of perfection, which, is, which really couldn't be further um, from the case. So hopefully we'll be able to unpack that a little bit um, as we uh, get into it. Um, now, Anne and I are talking about Judd because he's the subject, as many of you will know, of a very important uh, retrospective exhibition that taking, was taking place at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, it opened uh, early March, March 1st, uh, and unfortunately because of COVID it had to close after just 11 days. But Anne, uh, lucky curator that she is, was there for the opening. Um, and, uh, and Anne, I wanted to start just by asking you, what did you see at MoMA? What was, what was the exhibition all about? Uh, well, it is exemplary as far as the retrospective exhibition goes, because, um, you know, sometimes you go through a, a retrospective exhibition and um, yeah, it can be satisfying in some ways, but you don't come out thinking, wow, that was so needed, you know, and I've learned so much about this artist. I've seen I've seen this artist's evolution, you know, kind of. So, um, and I think with Judd in particular, it's uh, it's very hard to come to an understanding of what he's doing from just seeing one or two works. And very few institutions have more than one or two works. We are lucky in that respect. Um, and so seeing them as single items doesn't always do the same thing as this exhibition does. Plus it is installed with such intelligence and uh, sensitivity. The curator, Anne Temkin, said that um, the work's more or less dictated where they wanted to go in the space, but it's just there's some very nice kind of conversations that happen between the works. Um, but what I'd like to say that I was so thrilled by was uh, the presence of four works from the National Gallery that are on loan there. And um, hopefully the, this exhibition will extend um, beyond its uh, intended closure date so that more people will be able to see it. And I know that for Judd fans, this is going to be a must on the, on the agenda post-COVID, or not post-COVID, but as we transition to better days. And um, so our works are largely um, located in the first room, but also our painting from 1964 which is quite a rare and beautiful piece, is paired with a painting of the same period from the Museum of Modern Arts collection. And um, it's, uh, it's right at the entrance to the exhibition. This is just a black and white uh, reproduction of that painting, but, um, but the very, it's the very first entry in the catalogue resume. So an important um, work to open a retrospective with, I think. Um, now, um, and you mentioned, of course, that we have this great collection of works by Donald Judd, which is sometimes surprising when I'm talking to colleagues uh, in the States or in Europe who don't know uh, that particular collecting history. Um, now, we do have this great collection by virtue of um, the work of a, of a singular and quite prescient curator named Bryden Smith. And for those of you who don't know... Um, who's he? And, who's he? Who's that guy? Uh, who's and, 
and is uh, is Bryden's spouse. Um, and so we're hoping over the course of the conversation, and that you'll be able to share um, kind of some more personal anecdotes about Bryden and Judd. Uh, they remained really lifelong friends uh, from from the time, or I should say, for, for the length of, of Bryden's career, beginning really in the the late 1960s. Uh, until uh, Judd's death in 1994. Um, Bryden was a eulogist at his funeral. I mean, they were very, very sympathetic um, in, in lots of ways. Um, but before we get into that, that friendship, I just want to give a bit of a praise for, for folks who aren't as familiar with Donald Judd, um, just a bit of a biography for him. Uh, he was born in 1928, and he studied philosophy, and then he studied art history at Columbia University in New York. And it's often forgotten that he started his, his career really as an art critic in the late 1950s and early 60s. And he um, is best known really as an art writer until I would say his, his first uh, solo exhibition, which was at the Green Gallery in 1963, um, when he kind of uh, emerges as um, a sculptor, although he would, he would evade <laughs> that, that title. And we'll talk a little bit about, about naming uh, in a moment. Um, the term that he preferred for his objects were specific objects, and he articulated this in an essay in 1965. Um, he made his uh, objects uh, largely out of industrial materials, so things like aluminum, wood, plywood, um, that, uh, that are on view at, uh, at MoMA. Uh, and in the early 1970s, significantly for what we'll be talking about today, he moved to Marfa, Texas. Um, and he uh, bought up a series of buildings and established the more or less permanent installation of his work and work by um, other artists uh, who he associated with. Okay, so back to this, this connection with Bryden. Um, there was a kind of um, synchronicity between Bryden and, and, and Don um, in terms of their interests, uh, in terms of their kind of sense of mission. Um, for, for Judd, it was really, uh, I think you could say that he wanted to make objects without being categorized, resisting these categories that were so persistent uh, in the 1960s uh, when he was working. And similarly for Bryden, I think there was a desire really to, uh, to build a collection because so much of his legacy is really about his collection uh, building activities at the National Gallery of Canada, um, but also to make exhibitions that, that similarly, I think could be said to um, uh, avoid or, or, or maneuver around kind of traditional art historical uh, categories. Um, so maybe you could tell me a, bit, a little bit more about the, the connections you saw between Bryden and, and Don and, and what made them so um, uh, kind of uh, synchronous, I guess, in terms of their work together. Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, I must say right from the outset that uh, I sadly didn't ever meet Don in person. I heard a great deal about him and, um, of course, got to know the work pretty well. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, it was a great passion for Bryden, as you will probably be talking about a bit more, um, that he, when he first saw Judd's work in Toronto in the 60s um, at the Ab Isaacs Gallery in 64 and then 67 uh, in the Hart House Quadrangle, um, he was intrigued by it, but perplexed. You know, he wasn't really sure quite what was going on there. And... Um, Unlike his experience with Flavin, where he saw uh, Flavin on the cover of Art Forum, immediately had to go down and see it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then constructed his own uh, fluorescent tube and lived with it in his uh, um, living room. And uh, with Judd, it came. The great revelation came when he. Um, oh, is that the, the Flavin? This is the time to join the. Uh, so. Um... Some of you might know that, that Bryden did a Flavin show in 1969, so a few years before um, the, the exhibition in, in Ottawa. But yeah, so I just wanted to show that. Yeah, and there's a real connection, Judd, Flavin, uh, yeah, and the circle. But um, it was when he went to that exhibition at the Whitney uh, in 68, and he saw his first progression that he just became completely... If, as he put it, it was love at first sight, you know. So, so what their relationship uh, were of mutual, great mutual respect. I think as personalities, they had a lot in common, um, a sense of defiance, you know. Yeah, that's probably the one that he, he saw, eight inches high and 21 feet long, and uh, a love affair. <laughs> a love affair. Um, yeah, so, you know, they both, um, Bryden, neither of them were mathematicians, but they both had a great appreciation 
for what the language of mathematics and uh, to see it manifested in sculpture excited Bryden a lot. Like the idea of, I mean, I, I was never allowed to use the word illusions ever with, you know, oh, you have the illusion that it's good. It's, you know, changing in its depth. And so, no, it's not an illusion. So, uh, you know, there was that sense of the concrete, the specific uh, precision, but as you rightly said, neither of them believed in um, the notion of perfection. And Bryden used to have a great Duchamp quote that he would use to, um, you know, deconstruct the idea that there was such a notion of perfection. So uh, there was, I think, mutual respect. I think Don really appreciated um, the attention to detail that Bryden gave his exhibition in 1975 at the gallery, and I'll let you talk a little bit more about that. But um, so there was, uh, and then of course, you know, we'll, the sharing of a passion for margaritas. Yeah, Mar which we'll get to in just a minute. You have to hang tight for the margarita reveal, because yeah. that's a good one. Um, and I just want to, before we, before we talk about the 75 exhibition, I just want to go back for a brief minute to those shows that you mentioned Bryden seeing in Toronto. So Bryden was still uh, a master's student in art history in the mid-1960s. Uh, he was working at the Art Gallery of Toronto, as it was then known. Um, but he did see these really formative, if perplexing, exhibitions that included Judd's work at Isaac's Gallery in 64, and then again in Hart House. But so did a number of other Canadian artists. And I think it's important to remember mm -hmm. that uh, an artist like Michael Snow, who bought uh, a Judd sculpture out of that polychrome construction exhibition at the Isaacs Gallery, was also an early fan. And I think, uh, you know, Snow, of course, living in New York during the 1960s. Um, but there was a there was a kind of, um, there were affinities, I think, that Bryden felt with other Canadian artists. Yes. Toussignan, Molinari, a number of Quebec painters who yeah. also um, had an appreciation for Judd. Yes, I think that is true. And another uh, aspect of um, this relationship is that um, there were Canadian artists who were given um, modest, but nevertheless a showcase in Marfa. Uh, so Ron Martin's work was shown at the Chinati Foundation in Marfa. Um, Lynn Cohen's photographs were shown there, Mark Rodell's photographs. And, you know, Chinati is not a uh, an, an institution that is goes in Rajad, I don't think was somebody who went in for photography very much, but um, so there was a kind of give and take there, and I think the respect that they had for each other allowed for this very healthy exchange. And it's also interesting that you know um, Judd was quite close to Oldenburg, and he had Oldenburg do that wonderful monument to the last horse at Fort the Russell. Horseshoe, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the horseshoe. Um, and that, uh, you know, Oldenburg, and I thought, you know, it's kind of interesting because Bryden's two sort of collecting streams at that point, I mean, he was also acquiring some really great stuff for the gallery in terms of European modernist works, but uh, were pop art and then what one would call minimalism, but that uh, a term that Don absolutely did not recognize and would not uh, have his work categorized as. Um, but you'd think that maybe the pop art movement and movement put the pop art such as it was as the title um, and minimalism would have been at odds with each other. But there was a healthy respect that uh, Judd had for Oldenburg's work. And I think there was much more openness than um, he's sometimes given credit for. Yeah. Judd. And I think it's, it's interesting because you're right, the kind of the, the textbook um, understanding of pop and minimalism is that they are two, um, you know, really kind of opposed. Divergent, um, yeah. Exactly, uh, uh, kind of uh, impulses. Uh, but folks lately have been talk talking a lot about, you know, seriality as a combined strategy, you know, something that pop art obviously uses when you think about Warhol silk screens, and then the seriality that's present in work by, you know, Carl Andre, something like that. Yeah. Uh, plastic units. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting that Bryden was, had a foot in both, but really they were kind mm -hmm. of continuous, as, you're, as I think you're saying. Um, this, this idea that they weren't quite as divided as, as we often think of them as being. So now I want to um, backtrack a little bit. So, we, so we've, uh, you know, Bryden has seen these early exhibitions. He saw the Whitney show. He was really floored by that in 68. Um, he did Dan Flavin's exhibition in 1969. Uh, but in 1975, he organizes uh, a really important exhibition uh, in Ottawa, um, and I'm holding up the catalog here, which has become something of an icon 
um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of book designs, in terms of artist catalogs, it remains kind of astonishingly the only catalog resonate for Judd. Uh, in spite of the fact it was published in 1975, there is yet to be uh, another catalog resonate. That's to say, a complete list of the artist's works. And uh, Bryden assembled this with Roberta Smith, the now New York Times uh, art critic, and Dudley Del Valso. Um, so, I mean, the, the catalog, I think, has, has found a wide audience among artists and, of course, scholars, I think has really raised the profile of the gallery and its commitment to, to this type of work um, early on. Now, one of the other ways that, that you see um, this these relationships uh, unfold at the NGC is really um, through our our collection gallery installations. And um, for those of you who've been to Ottawa or who know the collection, um, you know that in uh, what's, what's affectionately known as the Voice of Fire Room, what we curators call Gallery C214, um, are a number of works of the so-called New York School. And these include artists like, uh, works by artists like Clifford Still, uh, Jackson Pollock, Barnett Newman, Tony Smith, David Smith. Um, and these are all artists that um, moved, although their work can be quite diverse, uh, moved in a kind of similar orbit to to Judd in the 1950s and 60s. Um, so Anne, I guess I just wanted to ask you to kind of fill us in a little bit on that, um, the importance of for Bryden of, of thinking about these artists in relation and showing these artworks alongside each other in a space uh, like that gallery. Well, you know, Newman was extremely important to Bryden and he started collecting his work in the early 70s. Um, not the Great Voice of Fire or Yellow Edge, which, which is a donation that came uh, just after we had acquired uh, the Voice of Fire. Um, so, you know, there, I think it's quite pivotal uh, in that room uh, because these artists were really in dialogue with one another. Um, they were pioneering, they were pushing the frontiers of uh, abstraction really kind of different from what the abex, the abstract expressionists were doing. But um, uh, so, you know, someone like Clifford Still, these were people who were also greatly admired by Judd, you know, um, uh, David Smith, Tony Smith, uh, Clifford Still, um, and also, of course, Newman. I think Judd uh, remained quite close to Newman after, um, to Annalie Newman, uh, the widow of, Barnett Newman and so on after his passing. So they were, um, yeah, there was a re really strong kind of connection, even though they were working in very individual styles and or styles, you want to call it that. They, um, they were, all of those artists were determined to make statements that and develop vocabularies that were particular to the sets of concerns that they entertained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a great celebration of, a, a period in mid 20th century American art history where there is a, a, a really in kind of crisp, intelligent sense of uh, of how to move forward and how how uh, you know what what boundaries to push, kind of thing, and and yeah. to make objects that exist in in architectural space in a very magnificent way. Yeah. Now, what's interesting, too, as you were talking, it made me think about, um, you know, Anne Temkin, the curator of the MoMA exhibition. Um, when she visited Ottawa to look at these works by Judd, she, she spoke a lot about how they become more talkative. As you put these works together, they, they yeah. have a kind of talkativeness and they begin to enter into conversation with each other. And I think you said that was kind of evident in the installation mm -hmm. in New York. But it's also something that happens in, in the Voice of Fire gallery is that you see this kind of call and response between works of art and works of art that you might not have associated with each other. When we had the great uh, untitled plywood series of six boxes that are now in New York, um, beside Voice of Fire, there is a kind of um, there is a kind of talkativeness, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. that, that that those things generate. So I think that that's um, that's also worth noting, and it's something that Bryden Bryden respected. I think he he he, he uh, obviously approached that intuitively, and he and he looked for these these works to kind of address each other in an architectural um, situation. Um, on the topic of permanently installing or somewhat permanently installing works, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about Marfa, because Marfa was this kind of storied place, obviously, where, where beginning in the 1970s, uh, Don uh, bought a series of buildings and, uh, and began to install them 
uh, permanently with his work. Um, but it's also a place that Bryden spent a lot of time going to. Bryden was on the board of directors of the Judd Foundation, the Chinati Foundation. He would go often to Marfa, um, and and that was a very special place. So I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about some of some of that and what that significance was in going to see Judd's work and Judd in Texas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, that Bryden really appreciated uh, the concept behind the establishment of Marfa, because uh, as you know, Judd had some difficulty with uh, how museums handled contemporary, particularly the work of contemporary artists. Um, certainly in the 60s and the 70s, while he was very anxious to have his work shown, uh, he had reservations about how big institutions would do this. And and um, and I th the idea of having a place where you could encounter works of art kind of freely outside of institutional walls was very appealing to Bryden as well. And I know when we went to Cape Breton once, he got very excited about seeing a couple of artists. Uh, Ertebees was one, for example. Terry Severson was another one where they had a lot of a collection of their own work installed in a really interesting way so that you saw it differently. So he loved that aspect of Marfa. Of course, he was very stimulated by the intellectual environment there as well because there were um, great discussions about art and um, they organized a lot of symposia. And, you know, in the 90s, they were kind of struggling a bit. I don't know what it's like now, but um, it was hard, particularly after uh, Don's death, uh, to keep everything afloat. And, and I think it's pretty stabilized now, I'm not sure. But anyway, it was a, a, a remarkable, some people might say oh, it was really egotistical. Not at all. I don't think so. I mean, he's, he sh demonstrated a sensitivity towards the community there. He, uh, uh, this is Don, he had uh, publications translated into Spanish so that the local community could avail themselves of publications and experiences and strong education program, artist residences. So, you know, it, it, it consists of barracks, which have been turned into uh, areas for displaying individual artists' works. So Ilya Kabakov's Russian schoolhouse, which is yeah. magic. And... Um, I went there for the first time in 99, um, and uh, despite all the times that Bryden had said, why don't you come with me? You'd love it. You'd love it. You should come with me. You'd love it. Um, but anyway, that was his thing, you know, and I just said, yeah, you go off and do it. But but it was it was a very uh, positive experience for him and, and one that made him think about how art should be experienced. Um, plus, of course, I think he loved being welcomed at the uh, Alpine Airport by Judd, who would drive in in his truck and he'd have a cooler in the back and all the ingredients for making a margarita and they soon shared margarita recipes and Bryden um, had picked up a recipe here in Ottawa. Uh, he traded teaching the bartender how to tie a bow tie from scratch uh, for a margarita recipe and um, he uh, imported that to Texas, and um, Don's uh, Texan margarita was the the one that's just basically tequila, lime, <laughs> tough stuff, you know, <laughs> lime juice, a, a little it's sprinkle of Texan. lime. Salt. I have to say it's much more Texan recipe than the Ottawa margarita. So um, I think this is a good segue. Maybe we'll open it up to a few questions, but stick around because I've got the margarita recipes, the Ontario margarita and the Texas margarita, which I'm going to post just after we answer a few questions. Um, so if for nothing else, just, just stick it out for a little while longer and we'll get some, um, some Donald Judd and Bryden Smith cocktail recipes, uh, up on the screen. Um, so if anyone has any questions right now, feel free to just drop them in the comment box. Um, anything about, uh, yeah, minimalism and margaritas. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's, that's totally fair game. Um, the drinking habits of artists, very much welcome. Um, but... <laughs> Anything about the NGC, about, uh, you know, Bryden's work as a curator is welcome too. Um, yeah, another thing that just uh, occurred to me was uh, the fact that he had already started to show work outside of museums when he bought 101 Spring Street, because that, that in itself is a kind of personal 
museum where he included works by Flavin and other artists. And of course, not to be missed in Moffat is the Chamberlain. Yeah. No, we should mention, we should actually kind of direct folks to MoMA's website, moma.org, which has a great um, yes. documentation of the exhibition. You can visit it virtually, installation views, interviews with, uh, with artists, uh, a great conversation between Ann Temkin and Flavin Judd, uh, the artist's uh, son. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of good content there. And when you're next to New York, you can visit 101 Spring Street itself. It's now open to the public, so you can do a visit there. Uh, we've got uh, a we have a question. Here. Oh, sorry. We've got a question here, and um, did Judd visit the NGC over the years? Um, well, he certainly he... came for his exhibition. And uh, between 77 and, unless I was on a work trip or something like that, I don't think he did come back. Uh, Flavin was here for the opening of the new building. Um, but I know that uh, that for the... I. Don't know how much of the family he brought up for his exhibition, his uh, retrospective in 1975, but he was here. And then Flavin Judd talks about the experience of seeing the uh, the rhomboidal plywood boxes, but it doesn't. If, so Flavin Judd is the son of. <laughs> it gets complicated. <laughs> Flavin Judd is the son of Don Judd and uh, named after Dan Flavin, of course. And um, as I think. Flavin Judd said his parents preferred to name them after artists rather than uh, saints. Than so. Christian saints, yeah, exactly. I <laughs> love that too. Um, we've got another so. question that might be a nice segue, Anne. Um, were the large plywood Judd works conceived in relation to the old NGC building? Uh, that's to say what we call the Lorne Building, which the National Gallery of Canada was in until the new building, which was opened in 1988 by Moshe Safdie. Uh, and then the question continues, is the experience of them different in the current building? Well, yes. I, yeah. Now, I think um, uh, that uh, what happened with the installation in the 1975 exhibition, uh, if that's what the person who's asking the question is thinking about, um, an additional rhomboid box was constructed, plywood con uh, uh, box was constructed in order so for it to be um, balanced with another plywood uh, set of units, I think six of the others. Yeah. So um, I think that it, it did work differently. Um, it was shown in, in a well for the 1975 exhibition. So on one side was our five unit made six unit at that point. And then on the other side was the other one. Um, I think what we have, uh, you know, one of the things that Bryden loved about that was that it gave a sense of human scale yeah. for him, like his own yeah. body. He had a sense of the relationship with his own body to that. And um, I think you get that much more in the new building in C214 because the ceilings are so much higher and it's so much more spacious too. So um, uh, it's still, you know, configured in the same up against the wall and so on. But it, we're also back to the five pieces rather than six, yeah. yeah. Now, the next question is, uh, did Judd have a large influence in the design of the catalog resume? I should mention um, that the designer was a really brilliant um, graphic designer who worked for various, uh, worked for the gallery for a number of publications, but also for the federal government, Aiko Amori, um, who uh, now works, I think, largely in glass, and she's still based in Ottawa. A brilliant graphic designer, really interesting book mm -hmm. designer. Um, but yeah, I think Anne, would you agree with me that I think Judd was was it has uh, all the, the the feel um, of of Judd, you know, the the kind of almost box like structure, the weight of it. But also, I could see where he and Aiko Mori would have been, you know, on the same page, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> on that, yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. a classic, and you can talk a little bit about how artists have picked up on that uh, uh, publication and used it as subject of their artwork. Yeah, yeah. Derek Sullivan, who's a Toronto-based artist, uh, made a great blank uh, Donald Judd uh, catalog, which is just a ream of eight and a half by 11 paper covered in this very 
um, recognizable uh, cadmium red light uh, cover with the kind of hand-drawn Donald Judd. So yeah, there have been lots of homage to, to mm -hmm. Judd and to the Judd catalog um, in, in particular over the years. Um, I think we should probably go ahead and wrap it up. We're now at uh, just over half an hour. Um, so I wanted to uh, remind everyone to keep in touch with the National Gallery of Canada uh, during this period. You can reach us at oh. gallery.ca, obviously. You can join us. Oh, Anne. Anne has Sorry, a there's a question. question here that I think warrants answering. Oh, sure, sure. How would you say friendship informs curating? I think often friendships result out of curating. Um, yeah, because well, either friendships or estrangements. <laughs> but uh, I think there is a, a way that you start to know each other much better by going through the process of uh, discussing the art and uh, how it should be shown to its absolute best. Yeah. And so, I, sorry. I think, no, no, I this idea of sociability too between artists and curators as evidenced by the margarita recipe maybe i don't know if this is if i'm if i'm making a bit of a stretch here um but is really also figures in in that and figured obviously in in the friendship between um bryden and judd i think we've lost oh there's Anne. good yeah sorry it's that silly thing on my phone that i, I tried to block but couldn't um, so I'll just wrap up by saying uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. You can tune in next week uh, again at three o'clock on Thursday for a conversation, uh, I believe, between José de Clampuis Bois and Serge Bellet around the Venice Pavilion and the Venice Biennale, which will be great, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to say goodbye to Anne and I'm going to share the yes. margarita recipe. Great. For all okay. of our, our <laughs> goodbye, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a gorgeous day and I hope you were watching this outside. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Anne. Thank you. Oops. <laughs>